Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, God. Hallelujah, it's good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. You may be seated if you want to. Now, sometimes my vision is not as good as I'd like it to be. I remember last time when Brother Stacy came, I said, boy, I, know, I think I know who that is. I think I know who that is, but I was not sure. And I thought he was here for Pastor Trina, and he was here to see me, but he knew Pastor Trina. The world is small, is it not? Amen, amen. And so I see some folks out there in the audience, and you know when, when it comes to the mask, you can throw me off. I might not recognize you, so I'm so sorry. If I should recognize you, I apologize, but I know we did not call you out as, as visitors and give you an opportunity to express yourself and, and say where you're from or, or who you are. And so I'm going to take a chance and just tell me I'm wrong if you've been here before, if I'm not recognizing you. But I want to give you a moment before we go on air to, to express yourself and, and welcome to For God's Glory Ministries. I'm so sorry. I just, ooh. Yes. Feel free to, oh, is that Sherman? Oh, my goodness. That's, bro, that's Deacon Sherman. Oh, my God. Thank you for taking the mask off. That helped a lot, Deacon Sherman. Amen. Well, I'll say welcome to your, your friend, the person that you brought with you. It's so good to see you, brother. Oh, my goodness. Deacon Sherman is special. He's part of our family. I see uh, Brother Melvin and, and Dad Lee coming in. So you know my heart is full. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Hallelujah for a blast from the past. Hallelujah. Amen. But you're never part of our past. You're always part of our present. Amen. Deacon Sherman. Amen. 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 It's good to see you, Papa Lee. It's good to see you, Brother Melvin. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. Are we online, Brother Marcellus? Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah to you all out there in online land. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen for the online church. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So glad to be here. So glad to see our people coming in. And we're praying for you, uh, Deacon Melvin Glover. We know you had some car trouble, but you now know, I believe you are online, and you know that we're thinking about you. We love you, and we're going to pray for that car. Amen. We're going to get that car right. Hallelujah. We're going to get that car healed in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. As Pastor Trina said earlier, we are continuing to pray for those who, in particular, we want to pray for the government, we want to pray for all people, but we pray in particular for those who are still being affected by COVID-19, either themselves or their loved ones. Amen? amen? Despite the vaccine, we still have had some trouble with that particular uh, 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 virus. <clears throat> and as you know, many of us have started to pray about what time it is in eternity. Amen? amen. That this is the beginning of the end. It's not the end yet, but it's the beginning of the end. It's setting the stage. Amen? amen. I've told you before, it's not about the virus itself. It's about all of the things around the virus. It's the policies. It's the things that will change. It's the people's attitudes. It's all those. It's helping to lead the way toward the end. It's helping to create the environment. It's going to change some laws. It's going to change our expectations. It's going to change requirements to lead us to the end of days. Amen? amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Again, I want to thank everyone that's here. It's so good to have our visitors. Uh, and I'm so glad for all of you who continue to join online and also to give uh, financially. You know, we don't focus on that here. God takes care of our needs plus some, but so that you can be blessed because the giving is part of your relationship with God. Amen. Hallelujah. And we pray that we will always have the wisdom to use God's resources the right way. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Along those lines, I want to give the only one announcement that I have that wasn't covered earlier is about our men's fellowship. Amen. amen. Last week. Amen. We have always been blessed to have a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful time. Amen. Hallelujah. Our men's fellowships have been wonderful. They've been fabulous. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. I remember the very first one. Deacon Sherman knows what I'm talking about. We had a great time. We didn't know. This is our first one, so we didn't know what to expect. And we somehow got it in our mind as men 
to decide to sing a special song because the women had their Women's Day first. And we said, all right, we want to show something. We want to let them know we're here. Amen? Amen. And so we practiced that song and we came up there with about eight, I don't know, Deacon, eight, maybe 10 of us, somewhere, somewhere in that range. And we just blew the women's minds. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We sang that song, I Need You to Survive. Oh, my God. Did we do it, men? Did we do it? Oh, my God. We blew it. Out of the, God blessed us that day. Oh, my. They didn't know what was happening when the men started walking up to the front. And God blessed us to really sing that thing. Amen. So I don't, I've never forgotten it. And each one of our men's fellowships have been a special blessing. We've gotten to a rhythm. We sort of know what to expect. The theme is different each time, but it is a beautiful time in the Lord. And so it's time for us to have our next one. Uh, and we found a date. It's going to be Saturday, October 30th, Saturday, October 30th. Uh, and as usual, will be from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. And I was thinking about uh, 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 Deacon Sherman last week when I announced this because initially we only allowed the brothers it within the ministry, within our, our church family, because we needed to develop a special bond. We needed to develop a trust among ourselves. We needed to get to know one another. Amen? Amen. And it was powerful that way, was it not? Amen. And so I mentioned last week that this go round, we are allowing those, we're welping, happily welcoming those who are not official parts of the ministry, who are not members. So if you are under the sound of my voice right now, if you're listening right now, online or in person, you are invited. You just need to let us know so that we can have preparation. So go to the website, email for God's glory at, uh, at AOL.com or just go on the website and you'll see the phone number and call that just to let us know in our church offices that you are coming. Amen. And if you're bringing someone else, of course, let us know so that we can be prepared to have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful time in the Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord another hand. Praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. It's always been so powerful. So powerful. Amen. Most churches you go to, we may not have a whole lot of folks, but we have more men than women. How about that? We got that on most of the folks. Amen. We have more men than women. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. So I wanted to point that out. That's a big deal. I'm certainly looking forward to it. And I know that uh, uh, Deacon Melvin Glover is not here, but I know he's coming and we're looking forward to having our theme, you know, sort of be elevated. I'm so excited. I had a talk with uh, uh, Brother Jason last night. I started to give him a little tidbits. We started to set the stage, lay the groundwork, uh, plant some seeds. And he, are you excited, Brother Jason? Hallelujah. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. It's going to be good. Yes. Yes, our theme is sort of a spinoff of uh, last week's message and a few weeks ago about what we can do for people, what we should do for people. When Jesus comes back, there's going to be folks saying, how come I'm not going with you? I, I heal folks in your name. I, I did all kind of miracles. I did all kind of religious stuff. He's going to say, I don't, I don't know you. I have no idea who you are. You don't know me and I don't know you. Where were you when I was in prison? Where were you when I was hungry? Where were you when I needed a place to lay my head when I was traveling? Lord, what are you talking about? We never did all that. We never failed to do those things to you. Well, you know what? I'm happy that if you've done it to the least of these. Amen. Right. Amen. And if you failed to do it, then you failed to do it for me. And if you don't care about people, then I hate your church. I hate religion. We learned that last week. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. So we were never, for God's glory ministry, I am grateful. Deacon Sherman knows we started out in a hotel, and then we had a half a space in a hotel, and then they started giving us hassles about that. This is a blessing to have this building. But we were not created for this. Yes, we need to have a place. We need to have a home base. We need to have a, a, a place for people to come, and we need to be able to worship God and give him glory in his presence and together as a corporate body. But it was never about the ritual of church. It was never about the traditions of the mechanized, the machine of church. Never about that. Never about that. Never about that. So we've always been small but mighty. We give scholarships. I said this last week. I'm sorry for those who was repetition. 
But we've given, you know what I'm talking about, we've given more scholarships than most of the big churches. Their members come to us to get money to help them go to school. It's not just about the school, it's about letting them know that they're noticed, letting them know that they matter, letting them know that God loves them even if they haven't loved him back yet. It's to let them know it's an extension of God's love through us, amen? We go into the nursing home. We don't go to the nursing home to do church. What do we go to the nursing home for? To come alongside people, to let them know that we see them, to let them know that they matter, to let them know that they may be frail and can't move real well, but we know that's not who they are. They've contributed to society. They are more than what they look like. To let them know we're not afraid to touch them. Now, COVID has changed some things. And yes, we give them the word. We started ministering the word only by request. We were not there. There's plenty of folks having church and nursing homes. We didn't come there for that. We asked them specifically. We want to come alongside folks. We want to get to know those people. We ended up becoming the default or de facto pastor of many people, which is what triggered our visitation, our hospital. We didn't go to hospital visitation just at random. We ended up doing it because we ended up being the de facto pastors for people who were in the nursing home. So when they went to the hospital, they called us. They called us. Amen. Amen. Am I telling the truth? Amen. 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 So there's and there's many other things that we've done. I'm just giving you a taste. I'm giving you an idea because what's happening with our men's ministry is the kickoff. It's this new reset point for our ministry moving forward. We've done many things that have been small but mighty up to this point. But at this date and time, it's time for phase two. Amen. Amen. It's time for phase two. And we can't start phase two talking about church mechanism. We have to talk about why we're here. COVID changed some things. It slowed some things down and it prevented us from doing some things, which reminds me of all of the, how we feed and clothe the homeless. I can keep on going. Small but mighty. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Adopting families, small but mighty. Hallelujah. So COVID slowed some things down. It curtailed some things, but we're ready to reset. COVID is not an excuse. COVID will not be an excuse. Hallelujah. It will not be an excuse. We thank God for these four walls. We thank God for that nursery. We thank God for our office. We thank God for the classroom. We thank God for the piano and eventually a piano player. We thank God for the organ. We thank God for that baptismal pool and we, all, and we now have a, a candidate for baptism. Hallelujah. And I said, oh yeah. And I said, and now we have a candidate for baptism. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so I'm just so grateful for God trusting this ministry with this calling to us. Amen. Amen. So grateful to God. And one of the main things that we need to do to be an end times ministry is to be able to tell the truth. Amen. Amen. To be able to tell the truth, you got to be able to hear the truth. To be able to hear the truth, you need somebody to teach you and preach to you the truth. Amen. Amen. So Pastor Trina was right earlier. We don't hold back on God's truth. Now, I've learned over time, I'm a more mature pastor than I used to be. I have to think about people's feelings, but I can't fail to tell the truth. Amen? Amen. You've got to know you're working with people. You're a pastor. You're a shepherd. First, do no harm. Amen? Hallelujah. I'm a doctor. First, do no harm. Amen. But, you know, I'm just grateful to God that he has given us the people that he has, the committed, consistent. Oh, my God. I can keep on going. I don't want to sound like I'm bragging, but let me just tell you, we have 100% tithe payers. Did I mention that? Hallelujah. That means 100% of folks who know from whence cometh their help. 100% of folks that know that whatever they have didn't start with them. The 100% of folks that they know that man didn't create anything. We just work with what God created. And that includes all of our substance. Amen. So how can we do so much when we're so small? Because you have 100% committed people, not just in life, but in their pocketbook. Amen. Hallelujah. And for Mr. Stacy's dad, I just need you to know, none of it comes to me, sir. Not a dime. Not a dime. So we pray that God will use it wisely. We pray that God will help us to use it wisely. Amen. And that starts with, if I'm already being taken care of by God because he gave me a great uh, job, a great career, and a great uh, you know, ability to take care of myself, then we should use it all to take care of not just these people. But the people we're talking about in the men's ministry, amen? The people we're talking about, you know, we used to, we used to go in a nursing home. We would actually create, uh, we would give Bible studies because we got, uh, what is it, 120 hours of Bible study, by the way, online. Go on the website. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. <laughs> including, verse by verse, including the book of Revelation. But they say, oh, pastor, I want this. So what we would do is we would give them a CD player, because it used to be on CD, and we would bring them all the CDs. This is one of the things that we did to minister to those people. If they needed something, we would go and buy them something. We didn't just pray for them, amen? Right. While we did pray, hallelujah. Amen. That was all off script, but hallelujah, thank God anyway, amen? amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. So in terms of the message today, I want to ask you a question. I want to make sure we're in agreement on something. Are we all in agreement that God deserves glory? Now, you, you see the name, right? If you're a part of this ministry, I, I should hear a really loud amen. amen. Do you agree with me that God deserves glory? Amen. Are we all in agreement? I want the folks online to hear. Are we in agreement that God deserves glory? Amen. Hallelujah. Now, that sounds real good. So if we agree that God deserves glory, I want us to come away today better willing and more able to give God glory. Glory. Are you willing to go on that journey with me? Amen. We want to be able, more able and willing to give God credit where he deserves it. Amen? Amen. We often say if we had 10,000 tongues, we could not give God enough praise. That is the truth, but it doesn't mean we shouldn't try. Amen? Amen. But unfortunately, mankind, even when we want to praise God, it's not in our nature to give God glory. It's not in our nature to give him anywhere near the glory that he deserves. Even born again Christians don't give God the glory that he deserves. We want to fix that this morning. Amen. amen. It can be unclear even in the Christian walk, even filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues, even going to church every Sunday. It can sometimes be unclear where your energy, where your efforts where your deeds, your actions end, and where God's begin. And so sometimes we fail to worship him and praise him for things that he ought to be worshiped and praised for. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. It's so much easier for us. It's so much more natural for us to take things for granted. Because God's doing something for us all the time. So it's so easy to take things for granted or to give ourselves credit. Amen? Amen. Or to give some person credit. That is easier for us to do. That is more natural for us to do. But since we're all in agreement that God deserves the glory, and we know if we had 10,000 tongues, we couldn't give him enough, but we also know that we should give our best. We should try. That's what this message is going to attempt to impart into us. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We want to give God, and I'm going to do a little definition or etymology here to, to give my, my, my daughter here a title because as soon as I finish preaching, she's going to say, what's the title? And I'm going to say, I don't know. I was worried about the message, not the title. You figure it out. Amen. But as I thought about what we want to get out of this this morning, what came to my mind to provide for a title for this particular message is that we, we, we know that it's not quite natural in these human fallen bodies to give God the glory and the praise like he gets in heaven continuously. We know that it's not natural. And so what I'm trying to get myself to do this morning and I'm trying to get you to join me is to give God super natural praise, super natural worship. If you look up the word supernatural, it's going to say a phenomenon or things that can't be explained by nature or natural phenomena. Amen. Yeah. So you can start to think all oh, woo, ethereal and spiritual and twilight zone ish. But I want to simplify it this morning. Super means above. Natural. We understand. I've just given you the context for where we want to talk about our human nature and inability and awful unwillingness to give God the glory and the praise that he so deserves. And so what I want us to do this morning, what I want us to come away with. Is the willingness and ability to give God supernatural praise, more praise than you would naturally do, more praise than your body really wants to do, more praise than if you didn't focus on it, your mind would get you to do. Amen. That means we need to be intentional about that praise. Yeah. Amen. Hallelujah. We need to think about the fact that we should praise him. Amen. At times we wouldn't normally think to do it. Now you got to 
You got to live. We're not going to praise God 24 hours a day. I know we have scripture that says pray continuously. You know you can't do that. And the writer didn't mean that you're supposed to pray literally so you can get into accidents on the freeway because you're focused. You get, you know, into the so full of the Holy Ghost. But we want to endeavor to go beyond our natural state, to go beyond what would be normal and easy, to go beyond that easy thing of taking it for granted, to go beyond that easy thing of giving ourselves credit be just because we don't know where we end and God begins. I want you to know, if you don't know where you end and God's begin, God begins, you better give him the benefit of the doubt. You're going to be right more times than you're not. As a matter of fact, you're going to be right all the time if you give him the benefit of the doubt. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Hallelujah. We're not going to have the excuse or try to use the excuse of you don't actually know. Well, how much did I give and how much did God do? Just err on the side of God and move on. Keep it pushing. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. We said if we had 10,000 tons, we couldn't give him enough praise. So it only makes sense to give him the credit. It only makes sense to err on the side of God. Amen? Amen. But that's not natural. It's not what we do. It's easier to focus on, to give praise to somebody we can see. It's easier to be aware of the contribution of those we can touch and those we can hear and those we experience in the natural, in the physical world. And so we worship and serve an invisible God for now. Amen? He's invisible to us for now. And so... We have to get beyond our flesh, which gravitates towards what it can see and touch, amen, and what it can hear. So we endeavor to be able to give and willing to give God supernatural praise. Are you with me? Amen. Hallelujah. So let's hear what, here's what we want to do to get started. Are you willing to participate with me? Amen. amen. Are you going to trust me to that? Amen. Trust me with that? Amen. I want you to close your eyes for me. We're going to begin with what I'm calling an, an awareness exercise. We've done this before, and I know it can be kind of scary to close your eyes, especially if it's in an unfamiliar place. I'm still going to ask you to close your eyes, and I'm going to keep talking until everybody closes their eyes. You two out there in the Internet land, online, I want you to close your eyes. I can't see you, but I'm trusting that you'll close your eyes. Now, this awareness exercise, some folks, if they know about meditation, might seem, this may seem for me, but this is not about meditation. But I want you to notice your breathing while you have your eyes closed. Just notice your breathing. In, in meditation uh, terms, this is a way of becoming centered. It's a way of blocking out other things by focusing in on your bodily functions, which we typically don't really notice. We typically are not mindful of. I just want you to notice your breathing. Just notice it. And, and as you notice your breathing, you're, you're, you're paying attention to something that is, is, in medical terms, autonomic, which means automatic, which means you don't have to worry about it. You don't have to think about it. Just notice your breathing. And as you notice your breathing, you may end up taking a deep breath, that's called a sigh breath. You may, as you pay attention to your breathing, notice this occurring. As you notice your breathing, I want to let you know or remind some of you that this thing that you're doing happens 20,000 times a day. So while you're noticing your breathing, I want to remind some and tell others that this particular very simple blessing from God is repeated 20,000 times a day. Amen? And so while you're noticing your breathing, I want you now to notice your heartbeat. You may have to put your hand over your chest, and that's okay if you do that. I want you to notice your heartbeat. That heart beats whether you try to or not. That heart beats whether you're awake or asleep. That heart beats whether you're sinning or not. That heart beats whether you're saved or not. That heart beats whether you give God any kind of credit or notice or attention or not. He is just that good. And that heartbeat happens 
over 100,000 times per day. We're just going about our lives and 20,000 plus times per day, we get God's oxygen into our lungs, whether we're sinning or not, whether we love him back or not. And our heart beats at least 100,000 times per day. And if you just put those two phenomena together, you come to somewhere about a million reasons from one Sunday to the next to give God some glory. While your eyes are still closed, I want you to just, you can put your hands on your lap. And I want you just to lift your right index finger, just the index finger and just the right one, because God has given you the faculties to do something that specific. All you have to do is think it and it happens. All you have to do is think it and it happens. That right index finger just lifts up. And now I want you to lift up the left index finger, just the finger. While you are noticing your breathing and while you are noticing your heartbeat, and now you realize after those two autonomic or automatic things, you actually have some will that you can exercise in your life. All of this is natural and it's all also taken for granted. Before you open your eyes, with your eyes still closed, I want to speak to you while your eyes are closed because you're going to hear me better. You're now noticing that you get 20,000 breaths per day. That's about 100, at least 140,000 per week. And we take it for granted, but somebody this morning can't take it for granted. Somebody this morning realizes how valuable that breath is. Somebody this morning cannot breathe, amen? While you're noticing these at least 100,000 per day heartbeats, somebody realized that they can't take that heartbeat for granted. Somebody didn't have a heartbeat. Somebody's heartbeat was not going regular like it was supposed to. It was going twice normal, amen? And somebody, thankfully not a lot of somebodies, but somebody can't take for granted lifting their index finger. Somebody lifted their right index finger and couldn't lift their left. Somebody lifted their left index finger and couldn't lift their right. If we said nothing else, we're talking basics here. We're talking basics and we could be praising God every minute of every hour. We haven't even talked about the house that you live in. We haven't even talked about the car that you drive in. We haven't even talked about the job that you have. We haven't even talked about the clothes on your back. We haven't even talked about any of the other manifold blessings. So you can be laid up in your bed and can't even get out of bed. You could be a quadriplegic and you can still praise God every minute because you're still breathing, because your heart is still beating. Amen? And if you're only a paraplegic, you can still raise both index fingers. Amen? Hallelujah. So you can open your eyes now. I hope that exercise grounded you in how worthy God is. We, we could keep going, but we started with the basics. So there's nobody that doesn't have manifold reasons, at least a million reasons a week to give God some glory. Amen? Amen. And so we could praise God for our breaths and our heartbeat, but it's not natural. We could praise God for our lays and our index fingers, but it's not natural. Amen? Amen? And we don't notice these things until they're taken away. You don't realize, you're not focused on the fact that you have a roof over your head and thanking him every day until, uh-oh, it's about repossession time. We don't thank him for the job until we don't have that job. That's somebody's testimony today, man. There is somebody's testimony. You have that good job. You, you take it for granted until the economy changes and they have to lay you off. Or heaven forbid, you don't handle your business on that job and therefore you lose that good job. Amen? That does happen. And so we're getting closer and closer and I believe now we're ready to go to the word. I do have a text, by the way. But I think your minds and your hearts are in the right place to hear what God is going to teach us through the word. Amen? Amen? So let's go to the book of Judges, chapter 7. 
haven't been there for a while, we do cover the whole Bible. <laughs> Judges chapter 7, where we're going to learn that God is keenly aware of the fact that we have this relative insensitivity to his blessings. He's blessing us right. He's blessing us left. He's blessing us up. He's blessing us down. He's blessing us all around. And yet we just don't have it in our nature to give him the credit that he should get. Amen. Amen. So God is keenly aware of this insensitivity and it matters to him. Did you hear me say it matters to God? I'm not trying to beat up on you. I'm not trying to chastise you. But, but it matters to God that we don't get, we, we don't have 10,000 tongues. He don't need 10,000 tongues of praise, but he needs more super above what we typically give. He deserves, sorry, I, I said he needs. He deserves, amen? Hallelujah. Thank goodness he doesn't need it. Amen? Because we'd be, he'd be in trouble. We're going to see that it matters to God and we're going to use a biblical example of one of the ways that God addresses this issue. Amen? Amen. Now, one of the ways I talked about earlier, and it's, it's not totally emphasized in the text, but if you get a little asthma attack, if you get COVID, if you get something that affects your breathing, all of a sudden you don't take those breaths for granted anymore. If you get a stroke or if you get an injury that prevents you from moving like you did the day before, you no longer take it for granted. And if you get healed of those things, oh, you don't give people the credit. I hope you don't. But then you're keen. Oh, all of a sudden you're you're acutely aware of who those breaths. <laughs> They're pretty valuable. There's a whole lot of them because now I have to work my way through them. They're not just automatic by themselves. They're automatic, but I got to work for them. You mean to tell me I've had this automatically and I don't have to work? For, I don't even have to think about it. Oh, what a blessing. What a blessing. Amen. So we're going to see that it matters to God and, 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 and one of the ways that he deals with it. So let's go to chapter seven of the book of uh, Judges. Verse number one. This will sound very familiar to you all of this particular text. The character, the main character other than God, that being Gideon. Amen. And we know that Gideon's story, so this, this, this sermon is not about Gideon's whole story, although that's fun, a story to tell. Little Gideon threshing, you know, scared the Midianites going to see him. He's trying to thresh the wheat, you know, so they can eat. But we don't want the Midianites to see it because they're going to come and take it. They burn it down. We don't want them to know that we have food because there's a siege for seven years. Amen. And God said, OK. I mean, the people cried out to God. You know, you know how we do when we no longer can take things for granted, right? And they couldn't take the food for granted. Oh, my God, this is just getting to be too hard. And they finally cried out to God. This is what we do when we're desperate, right? That's how God gets our, he gets our attention when we're desperate, right? All of a sudden, we, we can't hear. It's like my granddaughter. We talk to her when things are going well. She's feeling good. You try to tell her to do something, she ignores you real, real well. But let her get a boo-boo, then she wants a boo-boo G, which is a band-aid, by the way. Oh, or let her have a problem, and then she, or let her be afraid, and she'll run. She hears a truck honk or truck go by. She runs into your arms. You couldn't get her attention. You couldn't get her to hold your hand in some cases a second ago. But he gets our attention when you could no longer take things for granted. Amen. But we're going to look at this. Let's look at verse one. And I'll read it for you. It says, then Jerubel, and this is the name that he was given a nickname because when, as God was developing him from his scary little self into a, one that, that believed that God believed in him. All right. Amen. He didn't believe in himself and God didn't try to get him to believe in, in himself. He got tried to get him to believe in the man that God called and said that you're a mighty man of valor. He didn't identify with that. Amen. But God developed him over time. And he pushed over that bail uh, a statue and took down those groves. And so oh, he got a he, he, he got a reputation for being that's a bad man. <laughs> Amen. So Jeru Baal. Who is Gideon? That's his real name. And all the people that were with him, we're talking about not all, the, we're talking about the fighting men that were with him. They rose up early and they pitched basically their camp beside the well of Herod 
so that the host of the Midianites, that means the army of the Midianites, were on the north side of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. Now, there's a lot of stuff there that can trip us up like, okay, what, what, which Herod? Herod wasn't even around yet. Well, we're not talking about that same Herod yet. Amen? We're not talking about King Herod, but the well of Herod. And, and, and we may not understand what pitched means. That, okay, that means that this is a camp. They're putting up their tents, essentially, right? And what does it matter? What, what's the hill of Moray in the valley? What's that all about? You don't have to understand all that. You just need to know that they are positioning themselves for battle. We've gone from a people who are desperate to a God who has heard them, to a man who was called by God, to a man who's now been developed by God, to a man who was so intent on being absolutely sure about God that he fleeced God, which is where we get the term. Lord, I want to put this piece of cotton out here and I want the cotton to be dry and everything else to be wet. Okay, all right, you did that. I want to put this piece of cotton out here. I want the cotton to be wet and everything else be dry. If you can do all of that, then I'll really believe that you're going to use me to do this crazy, crazy thing. And I'll tell you in a minute, you're going to see in a minute why it was so crazy. First of all, you really, you, you're going to use me, little nobody, little nothing, get in. But then on top of that, you're going to say you're going to call me to do this thing that seems desperately impossible. Amen. So after much doubting, Gideon and the people are now positioned and ready and confident to do battle. Confident that they're going to win the battle, they're going to be victorious because God has said, I've given him unto your hand, so you're good. But Gideon still said, oh, no, man, okay, do this and I'll believe it. Well, no, okay, you did that, do something else. And God facilitated. God could have said, you know what, psh, psh, what will we do? We become impatient, right? But he called him and he knew him. He knew every hair on his head was numbered, right? He, he called him before he came through the womb. He knew what his calling was going to be before he ever lived. So he knew who he was calling. So God came prepared, amen? And so they are now ready and positioned, prepared to be victorious in spite of the fact that they were outnumbered Five to one. Despite the fact that they were outnumbered five to one. Are those good odds? Not in a battle. If it's people who bet on sports, who's going to make the Super Bowl? Five to one odds is probably not too bad. The NBA championship, five to one odds is probably not that bad, right? But if you fight in a battle and they have five men to every one of your men or five fighting people to every one of yours, those odds are not that good. But they align themselves ready for battle anyway. It looks like they start to trust God a little bit. Huh? Amen. Hallelujah. They were trusting and following Gideon, but that's because Gideon was hearing from and following God. Amen. And so now we go to verse Two, because for now, they're outnumbered five, five to one. So they're certainly showing some faith in the living God to dare to go up against this amazing army that was well fed and they were kind of fed. So now let's go to verse two. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands. The people, now I know you're, out, you're outnumbered, what, five to one. Let me hear you say it. Five. five to one. And God says, you're outnumbered five to one, but Gideon, you know what? You got too many, wait a minute, I don't, I don't have enough people, right, God? No, 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 you have too many people. <laughs> and, and, and so he says, you got too many people. It's kind of crazy. Too many people for me to give the Midianites into your hands. You would think he'd say, go, go get the women and the children because you're outnumbered five to one. No, he says, you're, there are, you have too many people for me to give the Midianites into your hands less. And this is where you understand God's interest. This is where you get to see where God's coming from, right? 
lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, put themselves above me, brag on themselves instead of me, credit themselves instead of me. If I do this with a five to one odds where you would think if you were five to one and somebody came in and helped you, you'd be giving them credit all the way back home. God says five to one odds. I don't trust you with five to one odds. Because you will vaunt yourself against me saying, my own hand has saved me. Amen? Got five to one odds. Oh, I don't trust you. What is this telling you? Five to one odds, you think, oh no, we give God the glory all day long. He's talking about, I recognize, I made you, and I've observed you. I know the lack of sensitivity that you have for my glory. I know the lack of the ease with which you give credit to yourself and to other people and to other gods in some cases before you give it to me. I know this. I recognize this. So five to one is too, too good. You go into it humanly saying it's not enough people. God says, no, it, if I'm going to do this, I want to do this right. If I'm going to bless you, I want to bless you to help you. I'm not going to give you the million dollar house because you ain't ready for it. I'm not going to give you the fancy car you want because you're not ready for it. I need you to be with me first. And I need you to be able to stick with me after. So I'm not going to give it to you unless it's right. And in this case, I'm not giving it to you in a way that you can come out of it saying, I did it. That takes you further away from God. We've all had it. Have you had periods in your life? You know, everything you look like, everything's either going really well. That doesn't bring you closer to God. Even though that really well means he's blessed you with that really well. But we don't praise God more. We don't pray to God more. We don't get closer to God during those times. In most cases, it's not natural. What brings you closer to God is challenges. What brings you closer to God is when you know you end and he's got to begin. So notice God is saying here that it would, he's not saying that it would be in their strength, by the way. He's not saying if I did this for you, it would be in your strength. He's saying that you would think it's in your strength. Five to one odds. I deliver you from the enemy. You are victorious. I, you would, I do all, I could do, be doing all the work. But if I let you do it, use a few swords and kill a few people, you're going to say you did the whole thing. This is what you're going to think. This is the way you're going to write history. This is the way you're going to remember it. And how do I know? Because of how you're going to act. And how do I know this? Because I've seen you. I've got experience with you. Amen? Amen. And so God said, no, not this time. Five to one odds are not good enough. God had no doubt in his mind what he could do. He just knew how history would be written. He knew how they would act afterwards based on them remembering their part and slowly or maybe quickly forgetting God's part. Amen? Amen? He knew that five to one still allowed for that frailty. He still, he knew that five to one, while those are terrible odds in our minds, he knew it wasn't, it was still too good for him to do the miracle. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. He wanted there to be no doubt in their minds that it wasn't their skill, that it wasn't their abilities, man, amen, their strength. It's not their strategy that won the day. Amen? amen? God wants to be sure about this. Does this mean that we don't have skill? Does this mean we don't have strength? Does it mean that we don't have strategy in life? Does it mean that we do nothing to contribute to what happens good in our life? No, it doesn't mean that. But what it does mean is there's a certain threshold beyond which we will not give God the glory. But the better we get, the better that threshold gets. The better we get, the more we can handle and still love God. The better, the, the better we get, the more God can do for us because we can handle it. The better we get, the more we can do with our own hands and our own minds because God knows that we know where the hands and the mind came from. We know that the hand can't move unless the brain works. We know the brain can't work unless the oxygen's there. We know the oxygen's not there unless the lungs come there. And we know where every breath comes from. And we know that oxygen can't get to all the places without the heart. Carotid artery ain't doing you no good without the heart. Amen? 
Hallelujah. And the carotid, without the carotid artery, your brain gets no oxygen and we could keep going and going and going. Isn't that a great science lesson? <laughs> Amen. Hallelujah. So he wanted to be absolutely sure that they understood from whence cometh their help. It was not in doubt, but their memories, their recollections, how they processed it afterward would be problematic. Amen? Amen. God knows that the more that we contribute to our well-being, the more we do, the easier it is to lose sight of God. Amen. Amen. So the smarter you are, mankind, the more science you come to know, mankind, or the smarter you become individual, man, the more intellect you think you have, the more influence that you have, the more uh, 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 friends that you have in high places, the easier it is to lose sight of God. Amen? Amen. The more well connected you are, the more those are the people you call instead of God and those are the people you give credit instead of God. The better the, the, the better retirement plan you have, the more you give praise to that and rely on that and forget. We can go all the way back to how you get to that retirement where well, you got the job. How'd you get the job? Amen. Oh, because I'm a good interviewer. Oh, because I have a good resume or because I have good credentials. Well, if, if we keep on going back, we'll find our way back to God. Right. Amen. But that's not what we do. And he knows this. But we're working on that. We're trying to solve that today. Right. That's why we're here. Even when we're desperate. Down to our last whatever breath, dollar, penny. Last day on our house, we got to move out. And God delivers us, even when we're desperate, even when we're desperate. It doesn't usually last long enough. Our gratitude, our amazement with God, our glorifying God. I already told you we have at least a, we have a, a million reasons before we even move a finger. We got a million reasons from Sunday to Sunday. Does our praise and worship show it? God deserves glory. He deserves praise and we'll never give him 10,000 tongues worth, but we better give him more of what we have while we can. Are you with me? So God said that five to one odds is a big disadvantage, but it was still too many. And so that takes us to verse seven. We're skipping down. So the Lord said unto Gideon, by these 300 men, and it's so much fun to talk about how he got to those 300 men, but, but he was five to one odds against, right? And, and so he says in verse 7, Lord said unto Gideon, by the 300, these 300 men that lapped like a dog, basically, that lapped like a dog when you told them to drink, will I save you? So these 300, 300 now, 300. I did the last time I talked to you about this, I used a little, I told you a different a aspect or angle of the math. The math we're going to talk about today is appropriate for this particular text in, in this subject. Amen? Amen? I'm not changing the math. <laughs> He says, by these 300 men that lapped, that's, that's what I'm going to save you through, and deliver the Midianites into your hand, and let all the other people send everybody else home. First he said, who's afraid? Oh, if I'm honest, I'm, okay, you go. Okay, I'm only keeping the people who are not afraid. Okay, we got some not afraid people. Well, you know what, Let's, when we go by the, by the brook, yeah, those who lap like a dog only keep those. So we got it down to 300 fighting personnel, amen? God whittled this down to 300 men. And now they're outnumbered 1,000 to one. Now you think that's good enough? 
Is that good enough to get their attention? And is that good? Is 1,000 to one. Come on now. I'm talking about one person. And a thousand people came in here after me. And you're one person. And a thousand people, it's me and you, right? Back to back. All right, we're locked and loaded. But there's a thousand coming toward you and a thousand coming toward me. What are our odds? We can't have enough in the chamber. <laughs> there's a thousand. There's 2,000 of them and two of us. A thousand to one. Is that enough? I don't know what your thousand to one is. Maybe it's your house. Maybe it's your job. Maybe it's your relationship. I don't know what it is. Maybe you have a health issue. I don't know what your thousand to one is. I don't know what your essentially practically impossible situation is. What I'm saying is you got to recognize that in order to recognize God properly. So it's a thousand to one now. Okay, God, you didn't like the five to one. You didn't, you didn't trust me with a five to one. So now you're going to give me a thousand to one. They're still camped, by the way, in the location and ready. But now he sent everybody but 300 home. Would you stay? <laughs> Would you be ready? Remember, none of these folks are afraid because we sent the afraid ones home. So he sent some folks who were not afraid away. But now that they're all gone, you, I don't know, these 300 might get me a little scared. But thank goodness he kept the right 300. Amen? God, it whittled it down to 1,000 to 1. That ought to be enough, right? Thanks, God. Whew. Okay, so that's the threshold, 1,000 to 1. You trust me now. Okay, you'll trust that I'll give you credit. Instead of saying, man, Jason, did you see me? I did, the, oh, I did that little karate kick and I you took my sword and I, was, I handled them, didn't I? We got them, boy. Woo! That's amazing. You handle your thousand, I handle my thousand. You know we, you know we good. We're bad men. Probably not. We probably say, Lord, look what you did. It was impossible. It was impossible. So I know it was you. But just imagine if you can get built up and mature to where you say, thank you, Jesus, for that heartbeat. Thank you, Jesus, for that breath. Thank you, Jesus, for moving that finger. Thank you, Jesus. Woo, when you get there, he can trust you. He can trust you. So this thousand to one should be good, right? God wasn't done yet. <laughs> he knows the sensitivity better than we do. Amen. Hallelujah. So let's go to verse eight. He's told him to send the rest of the folks home. I'm going to deliver the Midianites into your hand with just 300 men. Verse eight. So the people took victuals. We're talking about the 300 now. The people took victuals in their hands. And then what? What does it say? Okay. So these 300 men are ready to take on thousand and one odds. And what they take with them? Some food and the trumpets. God's not done yet. <laughs> food and the trumpets. And he sent all the rest of Israel, every man, back into his tent. And he retained these 300 men. And the host of the Midianites were beneath them in the valley. So notice now, thousand to one. Okay, God, you can trust me now. Nope. What did they take with them? Victuals, that is food, and their trumpets. Let's go over to verse 16, because I want to fill this out for you fully. Verse 16, same chapter. Chapter 7, verse 16. And he divided the 300 men. So they didn't even go all 300 together. He divided them into three companies, essentially, or regiments. I'm not a military guy, so I might get that wrong. But three groups, how's that? Of 100 each. And Gideon took one group of 100. So he was a centurion, essentially. Look at that. I know a little bit. And then the, someone else took the other two. He divided the 300 men into three companies. And he put a trumpet in every man's hand. What didn't he say? He didn't say he put a machine gun. He didn't say he put, they didn't have machine guns, by the way, but they had swords. He didn't put a sword in each hand. He put a trumpet in each man's hand. 
with empty pitchers and lamps within the pitcher. So essentially, both hands were full. One had a trumpet. I think, believe that was the right hand. And the other one had a pitcher. You can imagine a clay pitcher, right, or a vase or something like that with a lamp inside of it, or a candle, let's call it that, right? So the pitcher had a purpose, and the lamp, the light, had a purpose in God's plan, amen? But this is what they had, 1,000 to 1, and this is what they're armed with. Are you seeing where God is going? You don't have to see where I'm going, at least see where God is going, amen? amen. It's time for battle. They're now down to 300 fighting men, and they are outnumbered 1,000 to 1. And they only have two things. They each have a trumpet, and they have pitchers and a lamp and no sword. And yet the battle was already won. They only had a trumpet and a pitcher and a lamp because the battle was already won. God didn't say, I'm going to give you the Midianites into your hand. He says, I have given you the Midianites into your hands. Are you with me? Hallelujah. Now, it's so much fun, I'm, I'm almost out of time, to talk about how, how God's strategy, which men would never have thought of, why it worked. They didn't need to pull out their swords because the enemy, while they were trying to figure out that God had it like that, the enemy already knew that God had it like that. Isn't that terrible? When the enemy knows God better than you do, Amen. The enemy fears God more than we do. The enemy knows the reputation of your God better than you do. And so when it came time to fight, the fight went down like this. God had already implanted his reputation and the fear into the Midianites. Oh, my God, this thing happened. Oh, my God, it must be that Israelite God. You remember what he did over there? Remember that battle of Jericho? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. You got to be scared of them dudes, man. They're God. I know. I know that they're weaker than us physically. There's fewer of them, you know. But but, ooh, they're God. So here's the thing. You've heard about bugles or trumpets in, in, in battle, right? Well, not everybody holds a trumpet or a bugle, right? Most of the people have their fighting implements. Only a few people have the bugles. But if you have, if you surround them and you have 300 bugles blowing. Trump is blowing. Whoa, how many people must be behind that? So if everybody has a trumpet, they're going to do the math in their minds and oh my God. You see what I'm saying? Now, if each light is surrounding them and you break the picture, oh, the sound. Oh, there's more. There's more. Let me see. Where is it at? Um, I'm not sure where the text is anymore, but let me tell you, if you look at the time that they approached them, they, they approached them at the beginning of the second watch of night. The night's divided into 12, four 12-hour blocks of time. So it's 10 p.m., and they just changed watches, so they're kind of off kilter. The guy hasn't got the lay of the land. And one guy's just going back to sleep. One's just barely waking up. And so... They begin their attack at the beginning of the second watch. It's the middle of the night. It's dark. They just see these 300 lamps around them. They just hear this scary sound. And they hear 300 trumpets. And the words, the sword of the Lord or the God of Gideon. And they just got so scared that they begin to kill one another. It was so dark. They were so frantic and panicked, and the rest of them ran away. God already knew that. They couldn't picture that. That had never happened that way. They knew about walking around and walking around seven times and saying nothing, walking around that wall of Jericho, walking around and saying, they knew about doing silly things. They knew about doing nonsensical things, they, but they'd never seen this before. And so I told you in life to expect the unexpected, also expect the unexpected from God. You will not figure him out, so you may as well just follow him. 
You're not going to figure him out like that. You're not going to dominate. You're not going to read every, you know his concepts and precepts, but you don't know the future that he already knows. But he's advising you. The stock market is going to go up on this day. He's not going to tell you that. He's going to tell you, go ahead and invest. You either follow him or you don't. Or he's going to tell you, take your money. Now, I'm not telling you God is going to walk you through your investment life like that. What I'm saying is walking with God is like, I'm doing like Jesus said, okay? Walking with God is like this. So the more severe your challenge, the more clear it is to you that God is at work, right? The, the more difficult it is. You know, Jason, when you got that house, oh my God, there's no way you can get that lot. Everybody wants that lot. There's, it's just impossible. There's just this one lot that everybody wants, and all these people are lined up, and it's a lottery. You would think, oh, you know what God could do? He could make me win the lottery. One out of a million. How about I don't even have to enter the lottery? <laughs> Hallelujah. How about God's favor is going to make it so I don't even have to, the folks are lining up for that house. I don't even have to get in the line. Woo, you know what I'm talking about. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. But the more extreme the odds, the more severe the challenge, the more, woo, was that you? Because you were smart. You timed it right, right? That's how you got the house. No, no, no. You knew somebody. No, 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 no. No, you know it's God. That's why you're up here, woo, hallelujah, clapping. You know it's God. You know it's God. You got to spend time with your father toward the end of his life and be the son you wanted to be and give him a chance to be the father he wanted to be. Hallelujah. And you didn't plan that. You didn't plan that. You couldn't have planned that. So you know, whoo, it's God. The more severe the situation, the more our memories fail to fade. The more we do remember God, then the more we're likely to honor God. Amen? Amen? And the more well connected we'll be to him. What is our take home point this morning? God's fingerprints are all over our lives. I mean, constantly. We could just worship him just literally nonstop. Thank God he doesn't expect that. But we're, so, we're too busy enjoying the benefits to pay attention to the benefactor. We're too busy doing what we want to do with the air in our lungs and the movement of our limbs to stop and say, whoa, how'd that happen? We're too busy being ambitious and, and going after stuff and things and, 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 and the things that we want in life to stop and say, whoa, how is this all happening? Let alone once you get to a plateau or you get to an achievement, realizing, wow, God made this happen. It wasn't your resume. It wasn't even who you know. Because even if it looks like it's who you know, God planted that thought in their mind. God planted that thought in their minds. Amen? Amen? You might be special to God, but people can turn on you in a hot second. So if they still thought highly of you, if they still had positive predisposition toward you, you know what it's like in the corporate world, Stacy. You know what is who gets the job and who doesn't. You know those criteria. Amen? Amen. Hallelujah. So you need to go into that interview knowing you know God and he knows you and he, he takes care of the rest. Amen? Amen? We're just too busy enjoying the benefits to notice. You got to stop and know. Why did we do the mindfulness? So we can notice. Notice God. Because he's, oh, he's always doing stuff. Oh, my goodness. Hallelujah. So those breaths, those heartbeats, our mobility, the accidents that didn't happen. Even your health. Anybody ever been promoted on a job? You probably had good attendance because if you didn't, they wouldn't have promoted you. Well, why were you able to have good attendance? Because of your health. Who gave you the health? So who gave you the promotion? As you endeavor to go through life, you will have a hard time sometimes knowing where you end because you're supposed to do your part. 
and where, you know, the widow, she had to pour the oil, God, right? God provided the additional oil, but she had to pour the oil. You never have to get into trouble because you cannot clearly identify where God ends, where you end and God begins. You don't have to get tripped up with that because you have the ability, the knowledge, the wherewithal to always give God the benefit of the doubt. All roads lead back to God. Amen. All roads in your life lead back to God. Amen? Amen? So if we get the job, we say it's because of our performance. That's what our focus is. And so we credit ourselves. But we want to learn how to credit God. I'm hoping that this text, I'm hoping that this discussion is helping you with that. Amen? Amen. We have, a, we have a good time, the men, and, and one of the songs that we love to sing is that, I forget who sings, is the Wine and Sons, I think. But, you know, the world may say, it's all good, and that's fine. But we should say what? It's all God. It doesn't matter the circumstance. It doesn't matter the situation. We should now, as a result of today, be better able and more willing to say it's all God more quickly. Our threshold should be lower to give God the glory and higher to take the credit to ourselves, higher to point to people and, and various advantages we might have in life, lower toward God. So what, what happens starting to today? God gives more glory. God gives more praise. We will never be perfect, nor does he expect that. We're just trying to be better, amen? amen. So we've been reminded of God's bountiful blessings today. And all we had to do was pay attention. All we had to do is learn a little bit how to look for God, how to dust for his fingerprints. Oh, God is here. Oh, my God, I thought I was alone. I thought it was impossible. I thought I was a goner. CSI, God is here. I'm good. It doesn't matter the odds because I have God to one. <laughs> so let's not wait for the impossible and the desperate for us to recognize God. Let's have a better threshold, a lower threshold for giving God the glory, the credit that he's absolutely due. And as we do that, literally, to God be the glory. Let's give the Lord a hand praise. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Praise your name, Father. Hallelujah, wonderful Savior. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you've done. Thank you, Lord God, for all that you're yet doing. Thank you, Lord God, for things you haven't done yet. Thank you, God, for being you. Hallelujah. You're worthy, oh Lord. Let your praises be given out here on earth as they are in heaven. Hallelujah. You are so worthy. You are so worthy, God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah.